California is a gateway to the solar system and beyond. The Jet Propulsion Laboratory. JPL is a one-of-a-kind place. A NASA facility, it has been managed since the time of its creation by the California Institute of Technology, or Caltech. A visit to the lab is a reminder of historic adventures to distant places by spacecraft designed, built, and flown by JPL. The Voyagers and their grand tour of the outer planets. Galileo, the first spacecraft to orbit mighty Jupiter. Cassini, now circling majestic Saturn. The twin rovers, Opportunity and Spirit, that confirmed that water once existed on the surface of Mars. When visitors first enter the laboratory's museum, they are greeted not by a spacecraft, but by an image of three space pioneers from a half century ago, captured in a moment of celebration. A full-scale model of the satellite they hoist, Explorer 1, flies above them. Explorer was forged in the cauldron of the Cold War, at a time when JPL was building not spacecraft, but missiles that carried atomic weapons. This is the story of how JPL entirely changed direction and purpose. In doing so, the laboratory would emerge onto the national stage as the space age began. This is also the story of a satellite that would give the world the very first space science discovery, one that would change our understanding of how life on Earth came to be. White Sands, New Mexico. This is where JPL conducted test launches of its Cold War missiles. Close by is the Trinity site, where the United States detonated the first atomic bomb that brought World War II to a close. The lab's origins dated back to 1936, when a group of Caltech students and enthusiasts began conducting modest rocket engine tests. Those hand-to-mouth efforts would have likely died had not the U.S. Army seen uses for the rocket. By 1945, JPL's work was at the forefront of American knowledge of rocketry with this missile, the WAC Corporal. Though many Caltech professors wanted to abandon classified military work at the war's end, the arrival of the Cold War only intensified the pressure to tap the Institute's expertise in rocketry. In a certain respect, World War II has never ended. Modern weaponry and arms racing pose a great challenge to the very values that we Americans were defending. How long could it remain a free society if it had to become a garrison state, an arsenal? JPL's WAC Corporal was only an experimental rocket. But in the fall of 1945, a new group arrived at White Sands with rocket combat experience. Some 120 German engineers who had built Hitler's V-2. Over 3,500 of these missiles, each armed with a ton of high explosives, were launched against European Allied cities in the last year of the war. But as Germany collapsed, the leader of the V-2 team, Werner von Braun, led members of his group away from their rocket facility to avoid capture by the Russian army. During the escape, von Braun was injured in a car wreck, but he succeeded in his plan of surrendering to the Americans. 
The capture of Von Braun, many of his engineers, and a stockpile of V2s were among the greatest spoils of the war. I mean, Werner Von Braun, there's a dark side to, to his background in Nazi Germany. Building a rocket is one thing. Building it for an evil regime, using concentration camp labor that is worked to death, beaten to death if they step out of line, and thousands of people died in the process of building V2s. In the 1960s, Tom Lehrer, the satirist, uh, wrote a song about Werner Von Braun, and one of the phrases from that was, the rockets go up and where they come down, that's not my department, said Werner Von Braun. In other words, he wasn't concerned about what you do with these things or with the process you go to to build them. He just wants to build his rockets. The Army wanted to learn all it could about Von Braun's V-2. Over 60 of them would be launched from White Sands. There was, at first, a sense, you know, okay, we'll, we'll bring him over for a short period of time, we'll learn what we can from this group, and then we'll send them back home. And that didn't happen. Von Braun quickly Americanized himself. Charming and a born marketeer, he would become the most recognizable advocate in America for space exploration. He spun visions of a new generation of missiles and put forth grander ambitions. Earth orbiting satellites, excursions to the moon and Mars, and a battle station capable of raining nuclear devastation from orbit, thereby establishing once and for all military superiority. In their first encounters at White Sands, the German and JPL groups found themselves side by side, sharing the same launch pad and hangar. There was no doubt who had the larger missile. The tail end of this V-2 dwarfs a nearby JPL rocket. The JPL team, though, was not particularly impressed. They were ahead of the Germans, they believed, in guidance and control. And feelings about the war were still raw. The war was just over. There's a lot of suspicion about what, uh, uh, what, uh, what Brown and his team represented. Uh, there undoubtedly was a certain amount of rivalry uh, as well. And in fact, Louis Dunn, who was the direct, became director of JPL in 1946, actually refused to allow von Braun onto the laboratory grounds uh, at one point until uh, the colonel who was uh, uh, the liaison person at JPL basically said, yeah, uh, they're part of the army too, and you should let, you should let them on. So I think there was certainly a lingering tension. It took two years, but in 1947, the Army had the JPL and German teams working together. A 15-ton V-2 was mated with JPL's smaller WAC Corporal, which served as the upper stage. This combined multi-stage rocket was nicknamed the Bumper WAC. On the fifth launch attempt in February of 1949, JPL's upper stage soared to a height of nearly 250 miles. Though it did not go into orbit, the JPL rocket became the first object to reach beyond dispute the boundary of extraterrestrial space. A year later, a bumper whack was also the first rocket ever to be launched from a mosquito-infested swamp in Florida bearing a name few knew how to pronounce and even fewer had ever heard of, Cape Canaveral. The sense of accomplishment, though, had already been overshadowed by the knowledge that the Soviet Union had detonated its first atomic bomb in 1949, years ahead of expectations. America's atomic monopoly was over, and the world was about to plunge deeper into the Cold War. One Cold War dilemma facing the United States was how to defend Western Europe against a Soviet invasion without deploying a permanent full-scale army, a prospect that would damage the American economy. 